Hello, we would like to welcome you to another lesson by the North Main Church of Christ in Weatherford, Texas. And obviously, I, I don't know if I've specifically said this in, in previous recorded lessons, but uh, if you live in our area, um, we uh, hopefully will be back to meeting at our building soon. Uh, this lesson is being recorded uh, for Sunday, uh, May the 10th, Mother's Day of 2020, and um, we are not meeting on the 10th, but uh, hopefully in the very near future, as, as things allow, as the situation allows, we will begin meeting again at our building. and. Uh, and if you live in Weatherford or in Parker County in the area, we would love to have you uh, visit us to worship with us and um, you can get more information. Uh, just look us up online. It's the North Main Church of Christ in, uh, in Weatherford, Texas. Uh, go to our website, check our times when we get back to, to worshiping. Uh, look for updates there and uh, uh, some other resources, lessons, articles, and so forth to, uh, to help you in your study of God's Word. And, uh, and we would love to help you in any way that we can as well. Uh, a few weeks ago, we began a new study uh, dealing with Jesus and the Sermon on the Mount found in Matthew's, Matthew chapters 5, 6, and 7 and want to continue along those lines. Last week we talked about how Jesus did not come to destroy the law but to fulfill it and he made this rather bold statement and I definitely think the Jews uh, that were sitting there listening to him uh, would have taken this as a rather bold statement in Matthew chapter 5 and verse 20. He said, For I tell you Unless your righteousness exceeds that of the scribes and Pharisees, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. And so we talked about what that meant. How how could their righteousness? You know, the average Jew would have would have looked at this and said, uh, you know, the, the scribes and the Pharisees. I mean, they are they are the rule makers and the rule keepers and I can never keep the rules as good as they can and so so here's this guy here's this teacher and he's saying that that my righteousness has to exceed theirs well Jesus was making the point based upon his introduction what what we call the Beatitudes that it's it's all about what's on the inside and how do we develop our heart our spirit our attitudes towards God, towards serving Him, towards our fellow man, and how do we? What did that look like in Jesus's life, and and how do we pattern our lives after Him? Again, not so that we can be the best rule keeper, but so that I can have the attitude of I want to put God first. I want to serve others. And I'm not going to do that perfectly, but I'm going to follow Christ and I'm going to trust in Him. And by doing that, then through faith, we talked about last week, that just like Abraham, uh, he believed in God and it was counted to him as righteousness. You see, that's where true righteousness comes from. And so our lesson this week, we're... We're not going to look at the next section, but we're actually going to look at the, we're going to do an overview and how Jesus presents the following teachings throughout the rest of chapter 5. And so we're going to consider his words and specifically how he phrases these, introduces these topics, we might call them, uh, these principles by saying, you have heard it uh, was said. And so... Uh, you see that through the rest of uh, Matthew chapter 5, beginning in verse 21, all the way through the end of the chapter, verse 48. 
And Jesus says this and uses this phrasing six different times. And then he will follow it up with, but I say to you. And so we, we, uh, we want to look at that. You have heard it said, but I say to you. And so first thing we want to ask is, now what is Jesus exactly comparing or contrasting by making these statements? And so, uh, you know, you might have studied this, you might have uh, heard lessons along these lines and, or maybe read some commentaries, whatever the case may be. But some may, may try to make the claim that Jesus is contrasting uh, or, or comparing, making a comparison between the teaching of the Old Testament uh, and with what, uh, the, what the New Covenant or, or his, the teaching under his New Testament would be. So you might have heard a statement somewhere, something along these lines. You know, under, under the Old Testament, under the law of Moses, God's standards were external. Um, so, so how Jesus brings up the fact that, you know, you've heard it said, love your neighbor and hate your enemy. Well, someone could say, well, uh, you can, uh, you can, you know, it's, it's, it's okay to hate somebody as long as you don't take it, uh, let it get to the point of taking action against that person, like hurting them or, you know, or to the point ultimately of killing them, you know, of murder. Uh, but, you know, so hate is one thing, but as long as the action doesn't take place, then you're okay. You could lust, you know, you, you know, you could look at something and desire it, but as long as it didn't lead to the, the actual action, uh, in this case, adultery, Jesus is going to bring up in this passage in, in Matthew chapter 5, we'll look at later on. Uh, but as long as you didn't let it get to the point of taking action, then, then you know, you were okay. Well, according, if you, if you take that line of reasoning and, or you, you take it to the point or you try to say that's what Jesus was doing. He was comparing the old law um, and where, where uh, the thoughts weren't as important, it was actually letting things go to the point of taking action. If Jesus was comparing that uh, to now under my new law, uh, then, uh, then things, it's a matter of the heart, then um, even though some may try to push this position or take this uh, perspective on Jesus and using these phrases, then uh, I don't believe that's exactly what Jesus is trying to say here uh, in these passages and in the Sermon on the Mount and using uh, these contrasting phrases, you've heard it said, but I say. Uh, and so let's, we're going to start by questioning uh, the idea that has been put forth that, that God was not concerned with, with people's hearts or the matters of the heart under the old covenant. Kind of, kind of, that's what's underlying this idea of, well, he's, he's contrasting, that's what the old law said, this, but this is what I say, this is what my new law is going to be about. You see, underlying that, whether it's usually not spoken outright, but, but underlying it and the implication is, well, under the old law, God didn't matter about what was in a person's heart or, or what they thought or those sorts of things. Well, that's, that's just not true. Because you can read through the Old Testament and you can look through uh, the law of Moses and the writings of the, old, of the Old Testament and you'll find that truly God was concerned with uh, the hearts of his people. And actually, God many times... Yes, there were rules and, and regulations and you're gonna, you need to do this and you don't need to do this. You need to eat this and you don't need to eat this. You need to, all these sorts of things about, uh, a lot of those things de dealing with uh, ceremonial cleanness, ritual purity, so that one could approach holy space where God dwelt, whether that was tabernacle in the wilderness, 
uh, and, and in the early part of the nation of Israel or the temple later on you know uh, after, uh, David made plans for it wanted to build it uh, but Solomon uh, ended up building the temple and and those sorts of things you know how who could approach holy space who could approach where God dwelt and you know as an Israelite what did I need to do to keep myself fit to approach holy space that's what a lot of the old the old covenant and the law of Moses uh, was about but anyway uh, if you if you look at if you study the law you'll realize that's not all that it was about and actually underlying all that with how do I keep myself pure holy you know be holy for I am holy because how how does uh, how does unholy humans approach a holy God well God made certain requirements for that and let them know how that was to take place um, but also how I think about God and how I think about my fellow man it all starts with the heart it all starts in the heart and so uh, even from the very beginning of the law in in uh, in uh, Exodus chapter 20 when when God speaks the Ten Commandments to his people from Mount Sinai uh, the tenth commandment says in Exodus 20 verse 17 you shall not covet your neighbor's house you shall not covet your neighbor's wife or his male servant or his female servant or his ox or his donkey or anything that belongs to his neighbor well what is coveting you see coveting can be defined or has been defined as as a strong inward desire for something that you have no right to you see coveting by definition is an issue of the heart not actions now it precedes actions because if covetousness is left unchecked in our hearts in our minds then it can lead to sinful it can lead to improper actions on our part but coveting itself begins inside in the mind in the heart and so God has been concerned with our hearts uh, all along and that's right there in one of the the main parts of the law the core of the law you might say the Ten Commandments themselves and then that was at the beginning of the wilderness period at the end of that wilderness period as as the next generation is planning to go into the land Moses is talking to them that's what the whole book of Deuteronomy is about and so uh, Moses uh, mentions or God through Moses speaking through Moses to the children of Israel you know uh, talking to this new generation we find in Deuteronomy 5 and 29 God saying that oh that they had such a heart in them that they would fear me and keep all my commandments always see again God knows it starts in the heart and God has always been concerned with the hearts of his people in the New Testament when Jesus is asked by by the scribes and and one called a lawyer you know a specialist in the Torah in the law of Moses and this lawyer asked him you know teacher what is the greatest command this is found in Matthew chapter 22 what does Jesus say well he goes to Deuteronomy chapter 6 and says you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart with all your soul with all your uh, mind he would add in certain in some of the Gospels uh, and with all your strength with all your might in other words the greatest command is love God with with everything that you got everything that makes you who you are love God with all of that now now is that is that external uh, ritual keeping no with all your heart soul mind and strength that's you know that all that's the inward man that that's beginning with the heart with the mind the, the inner parts not just how well we can keep ritual ritualistic pra practices 
and so God has always been concerned with the heart. And so we see that um, King David, who lived under the old law, after he had sinned with Bathsheba, he wrote uh, Psalm 51, this uh, psalm of repentance, this psalm of remorse, this psalm of, of just crying out to God that, you know, I have sinned against you. And so, um, but look at how he addresses it there in Psalm 51 and verse 6. He says, um, Behold, you desire truth in the innermost being, and in the hidden part you will make me know wisdom. You see, David knew that God, is God concerned with outward appearances? Yes, but God also knows that that begins from within. And so God is concerned with the inner parts. And so then later in that psalm, in Psalm 51, verse 10, David wrote, and um, you may have heard the song, sung the song, uh, create in me a clean heart. He doesn't cry out to God to, you know, get me back in the habits of sacrificing and, and you know, and everything will be all right. Is, were, were the sacrifices important? Absolutely. But if they weren't offered from and, and through the right motivation, then there are many passages in the Old Testament, especially in the prophets, where God says, you know what, because, because you've shut your mind, you've shut your eyes, uh, you won't see, you've, you've uh, stopped up your ears, you won't listen to what I've told you. And so because of that, because your heart's not right, then even your sacrifices, God would say through the prophets, disgust me. The, your burnt offerings, they, they, I absolutely hate them they stink they're not a sweet aroma as they ought to be when when offered from a pure heart and a humble heart but god says no i actually hate your sacrifices and i don't even want to i don't want to smell them anymore i don't want to have anything to do with them anymore because your heart's not right so you see there's there's many other passages in the Old Testament we we could go to, but just for this lesson's sake, I, I think that at least gives us the foundation for for seeing that someone who takes that position that well Jesus was saying that's how it was under the Old Testament under the law of Moses, but this is how it's going to be under my law. That's actually not what he was doing, because underlying the Old Testament was it was all a matter of the heart it's always been a matter of the heart and god has always been concerned and wanted wants our hearts first and then our outward obedience because ritual following rule keeping without without that trust without the heart without that proper motivation then God is not pleased with that. God is not pleased with that. And so, so we'll just suffice it to say at this point, it's, it's not accurate to say that God was unconcerned about the heart of, of man under the old covenant uh, and that the, the old law strictly addressed externals. That was simply not the case. The more you study the details about the, the old law, the more you'll see that Jesus wasn't just like upgrading, like here's law, uh, you know, law 1.0, and now I'm going to give you law 2.0. I'm going to give the old law an upgrade, and now it's about the heart. Back then it was about externals. That's not, that's not what he was saying. Uh, and so, so I think you, I think you, Hopefully, we've started to understand that and started to see that. So what was Jesus do? Well, this is what Jesus was doing instead of that. He was, he was directly challenging their traditions, the man-made rules and regulations that the, the scribes and the Pharisees had added to the law, that they had laid on top of the law, uh, sometimes in place of the law. And so 
That's what Jesus is challenging. And so, some examples of, of even when, when Jesus was here on earth. Uh, in Matthew chapter 15, we have the account of the disciples going through the grain fields and plucking them and, and eating them right there. Well, they're, they're outside. They, they have not gone in. They have not washed their hands. The ceremonial washing that the scribes and the Pharisees did and demanded of others. And so in Matthew 15, verse 2, some of the Pharisees and scribes from Jerusalem, they ask Jesus, why do your disciples transgress, break the, not the law, why do they transgress the traditions of the elders? For they do not wash their hands when they eat, before they eat. And so notice the, the accusation laid upon uh, the disciples of Jesus was not breaking the law, breaking the law of Moses, breaking one of the commandments. The, the accusation was, why do they break the tradition of the elders and not violating the law of Moses? And so we see, uh, we see how, uh, how they had taken this, these, these traditions uh, to the extreme. And so this, and in, and in other, many other ways, the law of Moses had been, uh, had been set aside or at least put on a lower you know, standing and these oral traditions, and uh, many of which had been written down, but, but mostly we could call them oral traditions, um, had been placed either on equal standing to the law or in some places on a higher standing. Uh, than the law of Moses itself. Uh, these traditions were not found in Scripture. These were not commands that God had given through Moses. And over time, they had been blended in, added to, placed upon uh, the, the law so that, so that over time, you know, people hearing these orally and pa these passing down generation to generation, that, uh, that many would not, uh, many average Jews would not uh, would not be able to make a distinction between what was actual law given by God through Moses and, and what was traditions because they were all presented as these rules and regulations that must be followed. And so Jesus was attacking that, attacking those positions and those attitudes. And so that's what Jesus is addressing here. So let's take uh, another look at another reason uh, why uh, I draw this conclusion and why I think we ought to look at, at the teachings of Jesus here in this way and, and what the actual contrast or comparison that Jesus is trying to set up here. It's not old law versus new law. It's, it's God's law, how it was intended originally, and the scribes and Pharisees and their traditions and their rules and regulations that had been added to or in place of the law. That's what Jesus is, is attacking here in his teachings in the Sermon on the Mount. And so look, in Matthew chapter 4, just right before the Sermon on the Mount, remember we talked about Jesus being tempted uh, in the wilderness after his baptism. And you remember when Jesus was tempted, how he responded to, to each and every temptation. And we talked about that. He responded with scripture, right? And But how did he introduce scripture? This little phrase, it is written. So when the devil tempts him, uh, you know, come on, you know, he, he hadn't eaten for 40 days. And he says, you know, if you're the son of God, turn these stones into loaves of bread. You know, give yourself something to eat. If you're the son of God, I mean, you got to be starving, Jesus. Jesus would say, it is written. Then he would quote scripture and the devil would take him up to the pinnacle of the temple. And he's like, if you're the son of God, throw down. Then remember that the, the devil even quotes from the scripture we talked about there. And the devil starts with, it is written. And then he quotes from the Psalms. Of course, he's ripping it out of context. And then Jesus answers him by, again, it is written. And so again, the third temptation, you you know, bow, you know, bow down to me and I will give you 
all, you know, I will give you all the kingdoms of the earth. And Jesus, you know, he says, be gone, Satan, for it is written. And so every time that Jesus quotes from scripture, he says, it is written. And, uh, and so we see that over and over. In fact, Jesus, when he's referring to Old Testament scriptures uh, throughout the Gospels, he uh, uh, at least 24 times that he quotes from the Old Testament, he uses the phrase, it is written. And so if Jesus is going to be directly drawing from the Old Testament scriptures, then um, then he, more often than not, vast majority of the time, he references an Old Testament passage. He begins with the phrase, it is written. And we see that over and over again throughout the Gospels and throughout the teachings of Jesus. Uh, and so, so in our text here, in Matthew chapter 5, in the Sermon on the Mount, that now Jesus is is uh you know those who would say well he's talking about old testament versus new testament old law versus new law and uh and drawing that distinction well if he was referring to old testament teachings and, and old testament uh, passages or commandments then everywhere else in the gospels when he is drawing on an old testament passage or using an Old Testament passage, he, he begins with the phrase, it is written. But see, in Matthew chapter 5, he doesn't do that. You see, because here, instead, in, uh, you know, in verse 21 of Matthew 5, he says, you have heard that it was said. In, Matthew, in verse 27, he says, you have heard that it was said. In verse 31, it was also said in verse 33 again you have heard that it was said to those of old verse 38 you have heard that it was said and then verse 43 you have heard that it was said and so so Jesus when he's introducing uh, the principle or the topic that he's going to address and he's going to draw, make this comparison or, or contrast. He begins with saying, you have heard that it was said. Not one time in Matthew chapter 5 does Jesus say, it is written. And so often and almost every other time, if Jesus is referencing an Old Testament passage, a command of God, uh, so on and so forth, he will use that terminology. You know, it is written if he's a, if he's directly addressing an Old Testament passage, and we don't see that. <clears throat> we don't see that here in Matthew chapter five. And so clearly, I think I think that is a great case and, and a great uh, reason for coming to the conclusion that Jesus is not directly referring to Old Testament commands or or the law of Moses. Uh, in these comparisons or in these in these uh, contrasts, the principles that he's contrasting here in the Sermon on the Mount. Uh, he was referring to the oral tradition. Again, you have heard that it was said. He's, he's referring to the oral tradition of the scribes and the Pharisees and the things that people had heard from them or the traditions, those rules and regulations that had been passed down uh, through generations and and not specifically the Old Testament scripture or God's commands uh, or the law of Moses again um, and so so I think we can we can clearly see that uh, what Jesus is doing here so he's not contending with the teaching of the law uh, or the prophets he's not just uh, giving the law an uh, you know an upgrade, he was correcting the ways in which the law and the prophets had been changed, uh, distorted, or in some places just replaced with the oral traditions of uh, 
the, uh, the Jewish leaders, the scribes and the Pharisees. And so, uh, and so we might ask the question now, as we think about what Jesus is doing here, what, what does this have to do with us? Uh, well, first it helps us understand the, the lessons Jesus is trying to teach here and, and how he's going about doing that. It helps us understand this sermon so much better. It helps us understand when Jesus says, unless your righteousness exceeds that of the scribes and Pharisees, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. It, it helps us better come to grips with that because it's not about the external keeping uh, you know, of ritual, of the rules and regulations, or as I mentioned last week, you know, the, the checklist mentality. It has to do with where is my heart where is my, where does my allegiance lie you know uh, who who do I put my trust in and and where is my faith you know is it in God or is it in myself and how well I can check things off the list or how well I can can keep all the rules and regulations uh, and all those sorts of things that's what Jesus is getting here and that's what he's contrasting with no, actually, what's in your heart? Where, where does your loyalty truly lie? You know, what is your, who is your first love? Who is first in your life? And, and, and don't let anything come before that or, or take your loyalty or, or draw your loyalty away from God from, and from Christ uh, as your Lord and Master. And so... Uh, that's what Jesus is talking about here and that's how it helps us understand the sermon well also uh, it helps us understand that the pursuit of God through through a bunch of ritualistic extra biblical rules and regulations while it might make one seem very religious uh, and it might feel like the right thing to you know to have these extra rules and and those sorts of things uh, and it might give it might give a follower of Jesus maybe a, a sense of accomplishment and and make them feel more dedicated to have these extra things that look I'm checking this off I'm checking this off I'm checking this off it it actually does nothing to make us pleasing to God you see faith trusting in him putting our trust in him believing him that's when god counts it to us as righteousness not not how well i can i can or how many rules extra rules i come up with to to make my life look more religious um, but the scribes and them pharisees you see they were masters of the the ritual but according to jesus that type of religion or we might say that their religiousness you know that's not what counted in his kingdom in the kingdom of heaven and also we see that God is very strict in what he has required under both covenants because it all starts from within Jesus's teachings that we'll see about anger and about lust you know just as an example you see, he, it, God, when it's a matter of the heart, just like it was under the Old Testament, just like Jesus is, is trying to draw their attention back to, you see, it is a matter of the heart. It is a matter of desire from within. And that's, that's actually a higher standard than just whether I've done this action or not. If I can say, well, I haven't done that action, then I can say, you know, look how religious I am. Look how good, look how righteous I am. I haven't done that. But, but my heart is corrupt and my thoughts and desires just go in all sorts of directions that they shouldn't. You see, Jesus actually sets a very high standard. God actually sets a very high standard. And, and the principles that Jesus is drawing out in these passages really call that to to their attention and to our attention 
Because in a way, the Jew would say, I mean, they're so good at rule keeping, how can I ever be as good of rule keepers as they are? And But then Jesus, the way he presents it, then a person could actually say, well, well hold on a second. It's not actually whether I've done this or not, but Jesus is saying it's actually about my heart. And that's the important thing. You say, well, actually, that's more difficult than just, just keeping track of whether I've done this or not, or whether I've done this or not. You see, it actually sets a very high standard. And so somebody might look at that and say, well, you know, what, what is Jesus actually saying? Is, is, now are, you know, is Jesus saying that, that we have to be perfect? Well, uh, in a way, that's exactly right. Jesus is saying that in order for our righteousness to exceed the scribes and the Pharisees, it's not about the external, it's about the internal. But Jesus actually calls us and says the standard is perfection. And you say, well, well, how, how do you say that? Nobody's perfect. Well, let's look at Jesus' own words at the end of chapter 5. When, when he goes through these comparisons, you've heard it said, uh, but I say to you. And when he after he... He goes through these six examples. How does he conclude chapter 5? He says in verse 48, You therefore must be what? You therefore must be perfect as your heavenly Father is perfect. And you say, well, you know, I've heard lessons and, and believe me, I've given lessons and I've used this example as well. Because that word in the original language that's translated as perfect. It's looking towards the end, the culmination. It's the idea of completion. It's the idea of maturity. And so, you know, you might have heard somebody say, "Well, well, Jesus is just saying, look, you need to be you need to be mature." And so that's something we grow into, right? He's not saying you have to be flawless, you know, without any imperfection. Well, but look at the Look at the standard he's using. The you there is the disciples is, we could say uh, by implication, now us. And so is he just telling us, you know, well, just just keep working at it and you'll improve and, and you'll become more complete. You'll grow. Your maturity will, will grow. Well, if that's the case, then we, we would have to say that God is not yet complete and God is continuing to mature and God the Father is you see because that's the comparison he's making you therefore must be perfect there there's no lack try to be perfect you therefore try to be perfect no he says you therefore must be perfect as drawing a comparison, making a direct connection here, you must be perfect as your heavenly Father is perfect. It, is God got, does God have room to grow there? Does God have more maturing to do? No. God is perfect. And so Jesus, you say, yeah, that is a high bar. That is a high standard. And yes, that is what he's saying that we need to be perfect. We ought to be perfect. And you say, I mean, we can all say, right? But nobody's perfect, you know, other than God, other than, and the only human that's ever been perfect is Jesus Christ, God in the flesh. So that's impossible. Well, again, you would, I would say, yes, you're right. That is impossible. So hold on a second. Now, Jesus has said, if your righteousness does not exceed the scribes, or unless your righteousness exceeds that of the scribes and the Pharisees, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. He follows up these comparisons with saying, you therefore must be perfect as your heavenly Father is perfect. So what is a person to do? What's a disciple to do? Because I'm not perfect. You're not perfect. So what's the answer? Well, if having 
if having eternal life with God depends on my ability, your ability, our ability to be perfect, then it is impossible. If it's, if it's just up to us, and you see that that brings us back around to why Jesus would attack their form of religion, their outward external, their, you know, following their traditions above God's law and the principles found in God's law. You see, because if I can judge my righteousness um, in comparison to someone else with my list compared to your list, or whatever, then then I can justify myself. I can rationalize myself, and and even and even my faults that I know I have, even those sins that I know I struggle with, I can kind of, I can kind of make you know smooth that over, because I may know that I do some things wrong. I may know that I struggle with these sins, but but look at my list compared to his list or her list. And then I can use that to justify myself in my own eyes. And I can use that to view myself as righteous. And Jesus says, no, that's not what righteousness is all about. And actually, God calls us to a perfect standard, to his standard. And we know, then, then we look at Jesus and, and we look at ourselves. And I can't look at anybody else. Because if I'm supposed to be perfect as my heavenly father is perfect, then it's only me and him. And I look at him and I look at me and I say, I can't do it. I've already failed. It's impossible, Jesus. And that's exactly where Jesus, that's exactly the realization that Jesus wants a person to come to. I can't do it. Because then Jesus says, well, I've got good news for you. Because if you recognize your failures, once you come to that point where you know you're not perfect, like God is perfect, and you know you can't live up to that standard on, on your own, I can't live up to that standard on my own, but, but I want to be with God. I want to follow Jesus. I want to be in, that heaven, in the kingdom of heaven. And I want to be in the presence of God for all eternity. And then that's where Jesus says, well, the good news is God's made another way. It, it, you don't have to rely on your perfection to, to be with God or to enter the kingdom of heaven. And that's what the gospel is all about. Paul wrote in Romans chapter 3, uh, we'll finish, this is how we'll, we'll conclude the lesson with this. Paul wrote in, in Romans chapter 3, beginning in verse 21, but now, apart from the law, the righteousness of God has been revealed, has been made manifest, <clears throat> being witnessed by the law and the prophets, even the righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ for all those who believe. What does righteousness depend on and what is it contingent upon? It's, it's now righteousness... Uh, the righteousness of God has now been made manifest through Jesus Christ apart from the law. And now it's by faith, by faith uh, in Jesus Christ, so that all those who believe, just like Abraham, Abraham believed God and it was counted to him as righteousness. Uh, and then Paul also put it this way in Galatians chapter 3, uh, again uh, beginning in verse 21. And it says, for if a law had been given, which was able to impart life, Paul there is talking about spiritual life, eternal life, then righteousness would indeed have been based on law. But the scripture has shut up all men under sin. Uh, that's Romans chapter seven as well. You know, what did sin do? Sin, or uh, what did the law do? Law actually showed the sinfulness of sin uh, because with apart from law there is no sin and so God's law which was actually God extending grace but it also helped man to realize that I can't keep the law perfectly 
I need something outside of myself, uh, uh, separate from myself and my ability to keep the law because I'm not perfect and I can't keep it perfectly. So back to Galatians chapter 3. But the scripture has shut up all men under sin, made men realize that I can't keep the law perfectly. And so what am I going to do about that? That the promise by faith in Jesus Christ might be given to those who believe. Uh, verse 26, for you are all sons of God through faith in Christ Jesus. See, that's how the relationship is formed now. The righteousness is attained because it's given by God when I pledge my allegiance to him, when I put my faith, put my trust in him, stop trusting in myself and my ability to keep the law perfectly because I can't and I never will. So verse 27, for all of you who were baptized into Christ have clothed yourself with Christ. You see, when Jesus gave his life for our sins, he made a new way to be right with God, a way that doesn't depend upon my inability, my imperfect ability to keep the law, because I will never be perfect. You will never be perfect. And Christ presented a way that allows us and allows us to take advantage of the fact that God will cover up our unrighteousness with his righteousness, actually with Christ's righteousness. We can become clothed that, that I love that, that terminology there in, in Galatians chapter three and verse 27. You have put on Christ. Literally, that was the word used for what you would do with that outer garment, with that, with that tunic. And so if we have pledged our allegiance, we have put our faith in Christ and the work that he accomplished for us on the cross, and, uh, and we've been baptized into Christ, then we've actually are now clothed with Christ. And so when God looks at me, once I've, I've died to my sins, I've been buried with Christ in baptism. Uh, Romans chapter 6, uh, Colossians chapter 2, and then I've been raised. Then when God looks at me, he no longer sees imperfect Greg. He sees the perfection and the righteousness of Christ because I'm in Christ through obedience and you know through faith and through baptism i am now in christ i'm clothed with christ and i have the righteousness of christ not that i earned it but that god has has counted it to me and so now it's it's like that ledger terminology i was i was in the red <laughs> literally uh, my account was was uh was in the red. I was overdrawn because I had sinned and I owed that debt that I could not pay. And, and what I was owed was God's wrath. And what I was owed was God's judgment against me. But through obedience, because of Christ and, and what he accomplished, when I pledge my allegiance to Christ, when I die to myself, and now, as Paul would say in Galatians chapter 2, verse 20, a verse that I like to quote a lot, especially when I get to this point in a lesson and, and talking about what happens, Paul says, I am crucified. That means death. Crucifixion was a death sentence. Uh, I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live. I was sentenced to death. I, now, I died... I was crucified with Christ, but yet I live. Nevertheless, I live. Yet not I, it's not I that live, but Christ that lives in me. So the life I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. That's the good news. You see, stop trusting in yourself. Stop trusting in your religiousness. Stop trusting that uh, 
that your own actions are making you right with God and trust in what Jesus did and give your life to Christ. Die to yourself and say, I no longer want to live for myself. I want to live for you. I want to follow Christ. And, and, uh, and that's how righteousness is achieved. I, I hope this has been an encouragement to, to you. I know it's kind of humbling because when you actually think about what Jesus is saying and, and where uh, his standard is and, and where he says you, we're, we ought to be <laughs> perfect as our Heavenly Father is perfect, then that's very humbling because I very quickly realize and understand I am not perfect. But yet through my faith in Christ, I can be made perfect. And so you can be made perfect as well by giving your life to Christ, by believing in Him, putting your trust in Him, by repenting, that means turning away from your own desires and saying, I submit my will, my desires are, are now under God's control, under Jesus' control, and under His direction. And so that means I'm going to confess that Jesus is Lord. What does that mean? That He's Master of my life. He's King of my life. And so I'm going to submit my will to the will of the King. And then I do that by signifying that I've died to myself by being buried in water. That's what baptism is. And then being raised uh, a child of God, a new creature. And so I hope uh, that if you have not done that, that, uh, that, you will, uh, that you will do that, give your life to Christ and be baptized for the remission of your sins. As Peter told that crowd in Acts chapter 2, verse 38, Repent and be baptized to every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of your sins and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. And so I would encourage you to do that. You can contact us. You can uh, set up a, a study. One of our elders would love to speak with you. I would love to study with you further. Uh, if you have any questions, that, uh, that, would, be, that would be great. Uh, may God bless us as we strive to serve Him. And may we always seek to find our righteousness in Christ, not in our, not, not of our own selves. Thank you very much.